Father Jesus, we just thank you. You say strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so simply as we do nothing, that you will pour out your joy as we just simply wait upon you. Hey God, so we just thank you for simply resting and waiting upon your joy, upon your presence. Yeah, God, I just pray that in this room, every person, there would be an increase of joy in this place. Every person here, and that's their strength. They wouldn't have to earn it. They wouldn't have to try hard enough. They would simply wait for you to give the joy. So simply with hands wide open. Yeah. And to speak to any depression right now, you have to leave. And we replace with joy of the Lord. The joy. Mm. You say yes. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for the worship. It was really awesome. <laughs> So it's hard to come out of that. Um, let's just all go back. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, um, during worship, the Lord just told me to remind you about that he designed the seasons and they have specific purpose and how valuable they really are, even when it's a season that's not easy. So I just want to encourage you to embrace the season you're in and know that there's purpose in it. There's um, the whole reason for seasons in the natural is for you know, the, 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 our world to go into rest and to process of growth and then maturing and then pruning and then a rest time again. And, um, and it does, it produces a lot. And it also is effective in um, changing things and moving things. And so I just want to encourage anyone that's in a difficult season right now to just trust the Lord in it, trust the purpose of it. And if you're in a really springtime season, <laughs> Well, we just bless you, and I uh, bless all that God's doing in you right now. And just whatever season we're all in, I just want to just remind you that he's the one that designed the seasons and created them for you. So that's it. Well, this is your first time here. Welcome. Um, one thing that I really enjoy is when people, you know, bring feedback or, hey, amen, brother, or hallelujah. So don't feel like you have to be on your best behavior and be really quiet the whole time. You know, just be yourself, and there's freedom here. Um, and so I just want to pray. Whew, thank you. That was just a really amazing worship. Man, that was like, wow. Whew, just didn't want that to end. Near the end when I was just being still, I forgot I was actually here. I thought I was in my room back at home. I just felt so much peace, so I forgot I met the pearl. <laughs> it was a good time. So, Lord, I just thank you for your peace tonight and your joy. And uh, we, I just say, Holy Spirit, would you have your way in this place? God, we just say yes to the power of God tonight. We say yes to salvation and just anything you want to do. I just pray for a sensitivity of you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. So a few days ago, I'd like to start off with a little testimony. I was in Los Osos. And I wanted to get like a snack or something. I know I shared this last time, but this is different. And I didn't have a word of knowledge where someone had pain, but I, want, I went in there to get just like a glass Coca-Cola bottle, you know, the old-fashioned ones. And I was like, huh, I think I just want to share the gospel in Spanish to the people working there. So I said, hey, hola, Jesus te amo. And la presencia de Dios está aquí. And they were like, you know, starting to like nod and kind of laughing probably at my accent. And I, you know, I was just kind of sharing the gospel in Spanish. And, you know, they were like, and then he goes, Maria, Maria's in the back. And I was like, I don't know who Maria is. <laughs> and I just said, you know, El Señor, you know, is the father. And, and I don't know, something opens up when you can share the gospel in a different language. Sometimes we're so used to one language and you, it just opens you up to another level. And even if you kind of get laughed at or laughed with, uh, it's just a fun time. Um, and so does anyone speak a different language here? Maybe a couple. Okay, we got one. Okay. What, what, 
language do you speak, Ty? Okay, sweet. <laughs> I just want to encourage you guys, I don't know, just go for it. And just, we're in California, too, where it's definitely, we got a lot of Spanish. And just charge it. Jesus te amo. Jesus loves you. La presencia de Dios está aquí. The presence of God is here. So, you guys probably weren't looking forward to a Spanish-speaking sermon, but um, it actually reminds me, I had a dream a few nights ago. It was actually, I think, in a foreign country and a translator right here, and I was praying for people with cancer to stand up, and I was going to release healing over people with cancer. And there was about 50 people in the room at least, and they're all standing up, and it said, you know, Jesus' name, I just command healing. And the translator, though, wouldn't say what I was saying. I said, you need to say what I said. And he says, no, I can't. And I said, la Biblia, you know. And anyways, to make a long story short, in the dream, uh, his boss, like, took me aside. And he was trying to threaten me and trying to say, you can't do that. And so I woke up out of the dream, and I was like, wow, the enemy does not want me to pray for healing for cancer. So what am I going to do Wednesday night? I'm going to pray for people that even if you're not, you don't have it here, but maybe you have a friend or a family member, I feel like to really release healing over people and to take authority over it. Jesus is the name above every name. He's above every illness, disease, stage four cancer, stage three. And, and so if you or a loved one has cancer, you want to stand in the gap for them, can you just rate, can you just stand up? And I'm just going to, we're going to agree together for a miracle even right now. <clears throat> and so Jesus, for everyone standing here and standing in the gap, God, we take authority over cancer, every ounce of cancer of every loved one that is represented here we apply the blood of Jesus and we command full healing. Every trace of cancer has to leave now in Jesus' name. We just thank you for miracles tonight. We thank you for the supernatural power of God. It's not by might or power, but it's by your spirit, declares the Lord. And so, Father, we just thank you that you're the name above every name. You're the highest authority. You're the, you're the highest name. And so, Father, right now, we just thank you, Jesus, that you are the miracle worker. And even right now, we would even get, like, just text messages or phone calls from just encounters with God that they're having, even during the service. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Well, let me know if you guys get a text or something. I'm serious. Let me know during the message. There's a really good verse it's in Isaiah 65, 24. It says, I will answer them before they even call to me. While they are still talking about their needs, I will go ahead and answer their prayers. And there's something about God literally answering us in the middle of our prayer. God giving us the answer, giving us the solution. And I love that. I love the, the long suffering of God that we have and the patience and the journey, that it's a progress, but there's also instantaneous miracles that God does where it's, so it just happens and it's over. You know, there's times where you journey with the Lord and it's day by day, and I get that with healing. But there's times where God says it's over for the rest of your life. It's done. The door is shut. And so that is what God, that's what he wants us to contend for. You know, I celebrate the 10% healing, but also... Go after the 100% miracle, like for now. And that's what Jesus did. <clears throat> so I want to open up to Exodus chapter 3, if you guys have your Bible. <clears throat> I think a lot of times we're kind of asking for an anointed prayer. We want this perfect prayer. But sometimes the most anointed prayer we could ever have is simply our cries to the Lord. Simply our suffering. Actually, God not only hears but he responds. And so in Exodus 3, this is when God encounters Moses, and this is what the Lord is telling Moses. He goes in verse 7, so Exodus 3, verse 7, he goes, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, 
and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey. In verse 9, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I've also seen the oppression in which the Egyptians oppressed them. And so I don't know why God answers some prayers and other prayers are not answered, but to realize that God sees our suffering, that he sees our trials, and he, he's like, I want to answer that now. You know, he was actually led not because of their anointed prayers alone. It was he saw their suffering, and he said, I want to become an answer to their suffering. In verse 8, it wasn't up to the people stuck in the Israelites to get out of their bondage on their own. It said, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. The responsibility is on the Lord and not the people alone. When a sheep falls into a pit, it's not up to the sheep to try to get out. It's actually the shepherd that pulls the sheep out of the miry clay onto the rock. And so sometimes we think, okay, man, you know, sheep are not that smart. And so sometimes we, we, we get, the sheep get together. Okay, what should we do? They, they brainstorm. Okay, we're going to do this. Okay, we're going to... And it's like, no, just cry out to your shepherd and let the shepherd deliver you and take you out of the pit. But the thing about this, he meets them where they're at. He didn't say, you need to come to my level. Then you can, he's going to come down. He says, I have come down to deliver them. And it's not enough just to get delivered, but to bring them into the promised land. It's not enough just to get delivered from fear, but also to get supernatural peace. It's not enough just to get delivered from depression, but to have overflowing joy. You know, it's not enough just to get delivered from suicide, but also deliver others that are stuck in it. And so Jesus wants to use the very thing that tried to destroy us by the enemy to set others free. In. The very thing that tried to destroy you, God wants to anoint you to actually set the captives free. And so that is what makes me fired up. Because I understand what it feels like to be attacked by anxiety or hopelessness or nightmares. And so people that have experienced that same thing, I have empathy for them. But it's not enough just to say no more nightmares. I want to pray for God dreams. I want to pray that God would bring prophetic dreams that night. And so the very thing you're attacked in is probably the area where you're anointed in. It's actually probably your greatest strength. And to realize that I don't want to just get out of Egypt... I want to be in the promised land flowing with milk and honey. That must be some good milk and honey because I don't, he always says that's the promised land. I don't know what, if it was 2% whole milk, what kind of honey. That would be some good honey. And, and so realizing like that is the heart of God. Like his heart is to set us free and he really does want to bring us into our promised land. Like now. And it's not wait 40 years around the desert. Like, we should be in, like, this is my calling, this is my destiny, this is what I'm anointed to do. I don't want to be in the desert like Moses. He was in the desert twice, so 80 years. And so I want to be living in the promised land now. And I want to turn to one more scripture, or at least a couple more. But 2 Kings chapter 20, <clears throat> you know, and the thing about, I love the word of God because if you don't like it, you don't have to get mad at me. You're getting mad at God. So it's like, it's not my opinion. It's God's truth. So in verse 1, 2 Kings 20, it says, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray how I've walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. <clears throat> and it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, 
Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer and I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day, you shall go up to the house of the Lord and I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and the city from the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend the city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. <clears throat> then Isaiah said, take a lump of figs. So they took and laid it on the boil and he recovered. And so if Hezekiah kind of just relaxed in God's sovereignty, he could have heard the word from Isaiah, like who was the guy. He was, if anyone is prophesying the word of the Lord, it was Isaiah. And he could have taken that word and said, okay, I'm going to gather my stuff up and then die. But he had this, this resilience about him. He's not taking this for an answer. And so he goes, I don't know why he went to the wall. Like he went to the wall and started crying out to the Lord. And even during his prayer, the Lord answered it and gave him the solution. It's like as Isaiah was walking out to the middle court, all of a sudden, boom, the solution came. So like I said before, I love how we can be in the journey with God and it's the long suffering and it's the patience and it's the little by little. But I love how God brings immediate results. That there's times where God wants to answer us right now and bring the solution to maybe that 10 year problem. Maybe you've had a health issue for nine years and it's been ongoing and then God wants to bring the full on solution now. <clears throat> and I was playing this card game called Nerds. Have you guys ever played that? It's just a funny cards game. <clears throat> I don't know. I really enjoy it. But anyways, um, I'm pretty competitive. I never win, but anyways. Um, I kept getting the score one, negative one, one, and that's rare to get. Normally you get like 18, 27, minus 12. But to get to one, I got one like six times out of like 10, which is very rare to get. Anyways, I was like, okay, Lord, I don't always try to look into every number I see, but I see, I felt like it was a very clear word from the Lord. You know, there's a time, there's a season in my life, every time I go to the gas station, I look at the numbers, okay, God, what is that? Is that Isaiah 65 or 23, <laughs> you know? And I just want to hear God. I'm just hungry for his voice. You know, I go to the receipt, okay, this is uh, number 11 in and out, so okay, what is Isaiah 11? I'm just hungry, I just love his voice. And he speaks through parables. Anyways, I didn't know what the one meant for a couple days. And then I'm in prayer Monday morning, and I get this picture of a hole-in-one like in golf, when you do a hole-in-one, which is very rare. But you would get it in one shot, and then you win that hole, and it's over. And so I'm thinking, I was like, God, oh, what does that mean for today? And he goes, I feel like he said, I want to bring miracles that happen off one prayer that it's done with, that it's over. The person that has a disease or cancer, it's simply one prayer, and it's over. And it's not an ongoing, is it going to come back? Is it, it's done and complete. And that's what happened with Hezekiah. This was a solution that didn't, like, come back and forth, and it came, you know, it was done. He was healed for the rest of his life. And Jesus wants to bring those miracles to us where like he wasn't contending the next having to contend his whole life to keep it. He had it and it was done. <clears throat> and I love this because it was a very simple solution to a very complicated problem. This is a life-threatening disease. This could have been like stage four cancer. This could have been like <clears throat> worldwide COVID. And it was simply take a lump of figs and put it on your boil. I wonder how big that boil was, if that was a life-threatening <laughs> disease. I'm serious. That must have been a big boil. Maybe on his forehead. <laughs> put it on the boil. Uh, <laughs> you got to think. Um, but he literally took a lump of figs, put it on the boil, and then he recovered, and it was done. And so I'm thinking, Jesus, I love what you did thousands of years ago but you're the same God now as you were back then. And it's one thing to remember what he did, but also say, Jesus, what about today? What about for the people that are dealing with sickness, disease today, that you want to bring that one miracle where it's done? 
It's taken care of. It's, you're fully recovered. And so that is one thing I really want to pray for tonight is that it's, it's just the miracle that's Amen. game over, you know. It's done. You don't have to worry about it again. You don't have to do another prayer. It's one prayer, final, move on. You get to move on to something else. Like, I think God gets tired of our continuous, and I'm talking about myself. I'm not talking about you guys. But sometimes it is an answer because he wants us to ask maybe a different question or maybe change the subject. You know, if we keep talking about our problems for 25 years, he's like, hey, you need to move on to something else. There's other things we could talk about. And one thing about God's voice, too, I think there are certain times that he actually wants to speak to us. It's like, God, what time do you want to speak to me today? Maybe it's early in the morning at sunrise. Maybe it's at night. Maybe it's the middle of the night. So ask the Holy Spirit, what's a good time? Obviously, all day is a good time. But I think there's specific, like, windows of time that God wants to really reveal himself and download to us. And there's something about waking up early that God honors that sacrifice. Like, you could be sleeping in, but God says, no, you're choosing me even over sleep. I'm going to honor that sacrifice and speak to you. <clears throat> and the thing about the fig tree, it was actually one of the only trees in the Garden of Eden that was actually mentioned. And the figs was actually something that Adam and Eve covered up because of their shame. And so instead of having cover up our shame, it could actually be a remedy and a healing for our wounds. Romans 8, 17, it says, If indeed we share in his suffering is in order that we may share in his glory. So let's say you've suffered for eight, ten years, and you've been crying and trials and just gnarly stuff. God actually says if you share in his sufferings, you're actually going to share in a deeper glory with him. You're, you're actually digging a pit for the glory of God to fill. And I believe there's such a place of intimacy with Jesus that is found in suffering that can't be found in any other way. There's such a closeness to the Lord. There's such an intimacy with Jesus in those places. I didn't learn God's voice. I'm still learning. I'm definitely a novice and a student. But learning to hear God's voice didn't come on the mountaintop and when everything was great. It was in the valley of the shadow of death and saying, God, I need to hear your voice. You need to be real for me. This isn't just a game. This isn't just something I want to do for fun. I need to hear my father, you know? Amen. So, like, he has treasures in darkness for us. And don't waste that time. And sometimes the greatest refinement comes in the greatest valley of your life. <clears throat> and I love it, too, because even when God doesn't bring your answer immediately and you don't get that healing, you know, just knowing that he sees you in it, that he recognizes you, he sees your suffering. Genesis 16, 13, it said, Hagar gave this name to the Lord who had spoken to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have seen the one who sees me. So just knowing that God sees you where you're at. Like to, to be seen by the Lord, that's powerful. Like sometimes when you're going through a hard time, you don't want someone to fix you and tell you what's wrong or how to get out of it, you want someone to say, I see where you're at. I understand. Maybe not fully, but I see where you're coming from. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy 23, verse 4, this is when they hired um, Balaam to, to curse God's people. And it says in verse 5, Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. So the very thing that the enemy tried to curse you in ends up being the blessing in your life. Just like Judas, who ended up betraying Jesus, he actually opened up the door to actually Jesus going to the cross. So the, your, the very enemy, the very curse upon your life could actually be a launching pad to your destiny. I mean, you look at the cross, you look, Jesus went to a cross, and you're thinking, okay, that's game over. But that ended up being the door to salvation for everyone who calls upon his name. And so, 
You know, I was thinking of John G. Lake. He had one of the greatest healing ministries. And he started out by praying for people, not because he wanted to. It's because his family members were actually getting very sick. And so he just started praying for his siblings and praying for his siblings. And eventually it started growing. And people started getting healed. And his ministry birthed out of actually severe pain, you know, and, and tragedy. You guys doing okay? Okay. <clears throat> In Genesis 50, verse 20, it says, But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And so I'm not going to say God doesn't give disease. He doesn't give cancer because every good and perfect gift comes from the Father, but he'll, he'll actually turn it around for good because he's so good. Does that make sense? So he's not going to curse his children and so they learn a lesson, but the very thing that afflicted his children, he's going to turn around for a blessing. <clears throat> and the amazing thing about the Lord is he rewards his people for their suffering. Isaiah 61 verse 8, I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering. <clears throat> and it's got one more story. I want to just do a little bit of ministry time. This, you know, when David, he was anointed king, and Saul is trying to kill him. He's trying to go after and curse him and kill him. And actually, there's a time where it's in 1 Samuel 19. I'm not going to read it. But as Saul is coming to attack David, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Saul, and he ends up prophesying over David. And he gets out of like the anointing and he runs after David again. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him again and then he prophesies. And then he gets out of it and tries to kill him again. And then he, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him three times and he prophesies over him three times. And so the very attack, the very curse that was coming after David ended up being encouragement, probably some amazing prophetic words. Hey, this is where you're going to be. You know, imagine like that's the sovereignty of God is actually the enemies against you or whatever is going on, God could say, nope, Spirit of the Lord, boom, and you're going to prophesy now. Just imagine, like, for example, let's say witches and warlocks try to curse what God's doing here, and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon them as they try to enter the pearl, and they end up prophesying over us. Like, that's what was happening. And so that is the sovereignty of God that he literally would turn enemies into, like, friends in a moment of time. And it's the presence of God that does that. And that's, you know, going back just to Christ crucified, he, bore, he became a curse for us so that we don't have to have any curses. You know, people say, well, we have generational curses. Well, Jesus broke those curses on the cross, and we got to simply realize what he's done. And so even if your great-great-grandfather had a drinking problem or your great-aunt had whatever, it's like, yeah, that, that's, that happened. But what Jesus did on the cross, he canceled that. You know, and what the second Adam did far outweighs what the first Adam did. You know, the first Adam brought sin and death, but the second Adam, Jesus, brought life and blessing and forgiveness and freedom and liberty. And so just realizing that, you know, because if I look at my family line long enough, I'm going to eventually find someone that was cursed or whatever, you know, or, or not walking with God. And I have to say, okay, that happened, but the blood of Jesus trumps everything in my family line. The blood of Jesus wins. <clears throat> Got to clap. That's good. <laughs> <clears throat> and so sometimes I believe one of the greatest ways to overcome like curses or or attacks from the enemy is simply receiving the blessing of God. When you're blessed by God, no man can curse what God is blessed. If you're blessed by the Lord himself, and you try to come against God's anointed, you better watch out, you know? And so I just want to do just a corporate just prayer over you guys, and actually for families that are represented here, and you guys have heard this, is in number 6, verse 24, he said, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. 
and I'm just reminded of a story. John Ramirez, he used to be a Satan worshiper, and he gave his life to Jesus. And he said when he was one of those whatever, warlock, whatever you call him, they would actually try to put curses on people. But he said people that were covered in the blood of Jesus, they couldn't do anything. They said they were blessed by God, we couldn't curse them. And so know that you guys are, you were blessed by the Lord. You're covered by the blood of Jesus. So if you walk by whatever, trying to put curses on you, it just bounces off. The blood of Jesus is over you. So even if you don't say, God, I break off that curse, like we got to realize the blood of Jesus is above that. And it just deflects off. And actually that, that thing might come back at them and they might get saved or something. They might get delivered, they might get prophesied over. Or they might start prophesying over you, just like Saul did to David. And so, you know, just realizing that in Numbers 22, 12, say, God said, Balaam, there's no use in you going. He told Balaam, don't even go. Why are you going to try to curse my people? What I have blessed, you cannot curse. So why are you going to waste your time? It's like... God, I feel the Holy Spirit. Whew. It's like God telling, you know, whatever, whatever. It doesn't matter who it is. Don't even go. Why are you going to try to even curse God's anointed? It's going to be a waste of time. You might as well go home and get saved and then prophesy over them. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> hmm. Okay, so, thank you, Lord. I feel like, huh, this is fun. Okay. You guys doing okay? Yes. <laughs> um, so let's see. About a week and a half ago, we were at the well, and we we're just praying for people for impartation, and um, like Elijah and Elisha, where the, the anointing would come upon them, and they would get a gift. And so I prayed that before, and it's like, okay, I don't really see instantaneous results. Um but we're, we're praying for Tokoa right over here. Is it okay to talk about this? I think I asked. And um, I pray for the gift of healing for her. And literally two days later, she gets a dream that she got the gift, like very specific details. And then a couple days later, she's at work, and she's feeling where people have pain in their body. And she's like, I don't know what to do, but I'm feeling their pain, you know. And I, and I told her, like, even if you don't step out, you have the gift, like, for your life. So even if you don't use it, it's by grace. And so I want to celebrate what God did and not to keep it hidden. Because that's a powerful thing, you know. And what, a, like, that can spread like wildfire on the Central Coast. And so I was praying, um, like, okay, God, what do you want to do with that, you know. And he said, well, just honor me in it. And let me do what I want to do. Like, it's like, don't need to force it. Just thank him for doing that. I think that's amazing. You know? Sometimes we, we're like, God, I want this thing to happen. I want this. What if we celebrated something like that ends up being a domino effect for people? Because we have an opportunity to thank him or be offended and say, well, why not me, God? Why not me? But you actually thank God what he has done in someone else's life. You get to receive that as well. And, and so that's one thing I want to just pray for anyone that maybe they've been hungering after just the gifts of the Spirit, you know? And I'm not even going to, just like that dream I had, we, we weren't even praying, we weren't laying hands on people. It was like this far away, and they're about to get healed. Um, and there's something about you just keep knocking until it happens. And so I'm just going to do one prayer, and then we're just going to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> if you feel the fire of God, if you feel the presence of the Lord, maybe you feel nothing at all because it's by faith. And so let me just pray. And we're going to do one more prayer after and then we'll be done. And so, Lord, we thank you that you're the giver of good gifts, that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. And God, I just pray that people that maybe they've come out through like a really trying season, that it's not enough just to get healed up, that but you would actually bring gifts to your children. So Lord, I just pray that there would be a impartation of the gifts of the Spirit for your, your sons and your daughters tonight. 
We say today is the day. We're not going to wait one, like a year from now. We say today. We're actually going to put a, a demand on the anointing Lord, and we say today is the day. And we say we're not going to have to lay hands on people. We're just going to say, say the word, and Holy Spirit, you can do it. And so, God, we just call forth the gift of the Spirit for your, your body right now. I pray that people that normally don't dream, they would start dreaming. People that have been getting nightmares, they would, they would not only get set free from that, but they'd be getting prophetic dreams at night. People that have been suffering with anxiety or depression, God, we, we pray not only freedom in that area, but supernatural peace and joy. People that are dealing with suicide, I pray that you would use them to actually save people's lives during this time. And God, I'm just thinking right now just how COVID was trying to do all these things. You would actually allow that and turn it into a blessing for God's people and actually bring uh, it would bring such a awakening to the body of Christ. It would bring in the greatest harvest of all time. And so, God, we thank you. It's actually a launching pad for the, the next revival. God, we thank you for that. We actually thank you <laughs> for that. It's actually shooken up the body to be like, oh, my gosh, we need to know God at a deeper level. And then I feel like just to pray, people with um, ongoing health conditions, just right where you are, just put your hand on your heart. Sure, feel the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you that you became a curse for us on when you were hung on a tree, and so every curse that's been tried to attach to our life. It doesn't matter how it got there, where, all the details. We thank you that you bore all of our curses, all of our infirmities, all of our diseases, all of our sins on the cross. So God, we place any affliction, any ongoing illness, we just put it on the Son of God, Jesus. And we receive your healing right now. We receive your shalom. We, we receive your well-being. And God, just like in Hezekiah when he had the immediate solution, God, I pray that this would be the day that it's over. God, we just thank you for miracles tonight, right where they're seated, because you come down to us. Yeah, God, I just pray for miracles tonight. Yeah, and just I just feel like God's going to, I feel like there's going to be dreams tonight for people too of even like, hey, have this, eat this tomorrow morning. Like eat an orange, eat a fig. I don't know, just I'm serious. So obviously I'm serious because why well, I wouldn't be saying it. <laughs> or even like, hey, have a fig Newton. I know it sounds kind of crazy. Um, but that's, is, it was pretty crazy for Hezekiah to just have, hey, put this lump of figs on your boil. I probably didn't make a lot of sense. And so, God, we just say solutions to people's problems. Whatever problems that have been agonizing them, whether it's been financial debt, whether it's been whatever it is, we just thank you for Holy Spirit giving them just a fresh word from heaven, just a simple word that would actually complete the problem. God, I pray you would wake them up at night on the drive home tonight. We just thank you for the word of Holy Spirit. All you need is one word. He sent out his word and they were healed. Just one word you need from the Father. That's it. So Jesus, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you that healing is not in a formula. It's not a routine. It's a person. And it's in his voice. Lord. Yeah, so we just seal this all up in Jesus' name.